Boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to Casual Friday Live. Uh, we are doing this live because the NBA, as you may know, uh, have basically turned uh, Friday Night Knicks into Thursday Night Knicks, and we play like every single Thursday of 2024. So um, we decided, you know what, let's do something on a Friday this time. Let's do it live, and we're going to answer your questions. Um, but before we get into those questions, I want to do a quick vibe check Vibe check with my partner in crime, XJ the Incredible. XJ, how are the vibes? What's up, Sean? What's up, everybody? Uh, the vibes the vibes are yelping in pain, but we're fine. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> the, vibes, the vibes say to do, don't listen to how we sound. Just trust us. Everything's okay. I, I, I'm honestly, I'm feeling good. Um, you know, the Knicks have won two in a row. They should have won two in a row playing really, really bad opponents, but I'm happy as long as OG Ananobi is in the lineup. So the vibes are always good. Um, you know, I'm, I am concerned from what we saw last night, uh, what we saw late last night for those of us who stayed up to watch it. We, we heard a lot of painful sounds. We saw a lot of painful gestures. Um, OG Ananobi stayed in the game, continued to play despite some shots looking like it was incredibly painful to even snap his wrist and his and his elbow on the release. But he hung in there, so you know as long as he hangs in there, and yeah, I'm gonna choose to believe the reports that he's fine and that this is normal and expected. Maybe being blindly optimistic, but that's where I'm at. To me, as long as OG is available, OG and Jalen Brunson are available. The vibes are are just fine for me and. We'll wait to get the rest of the team back. I, I I feel you. Yeah, like when you hear like, oh, this still hurts. I thought we were past this by now. That's why it took six weeks. But if they say it's, if it's if medical says it's normal, then medical says it's normal. So it's medical, <laughs> right? Um, for me, the vibes are anxious because for me, at, like we're just like after so long, we finally got one of the two guys back in OG. Um, you know, we've all been trying to play like doctor, not doctor, but like, yes, we're actually playing Twitter doctor. Like, all right, well, he'll be back. When is he'll be back? He'll be back. He'll be, oh, he'll be back in a few days. In a few days turn into two weeks. It's a few weeks turn into a month. Uh, I had set a line, the over under for uh, Mr. Ananobi at St. Patrick's Day. And I set the line for Mr. Randall at the 1st of April. Uh, the uh, We hit the under on OG. Hopefully we hit the under on julius and mitch honestly whenever you come back you let it like that's up to, that's up to you because feet for big men are not to be messed with so the last thing we want is a re-aggravation of that and yep. isaiah hornstein is holding on to fort so the vibes are anxious because we, we just want to see what this team looks like for longer than 30 days so <laughs> Yeah, I like. I mean, is. I like your. I like your. Uh, your lines there. The, the, clearly, the St. Patrick's Day line was incredible because I thought OG would be back much sooner than that. So you had the right amount of skepticism there. Um, but yeah, I like the lines. They sound good. Oh, oh, I set that line in late February. Like when it was as soon. When it was like, I'm not gonna act like okay, you know, Super Bowl Sunday. I said, oh, it's six weeks. It, it'll be St. <laughs> Patrick's Day. But yeah, oh, after I got like. You. It was like probably like the last week of February. I said, you know what? It's probably St. Patrick's Day. Now, if you want to give me credit for Julius Randle, April first, that's fine. We'll see if that. We'll see what that happens. He's, clearly, he's practicing. He's taking light contact. But, um, yeah, I just we just, I just we just want to get our guys back, and hopefully we hopefully. OG won't be yelp, yelping in pain. Although it's hilarious. Someone tweeted that OG will yelp in pain and then use that same elbow to do a reverse dunk. And so it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good sign if he can just be in that much pain and just like play through it anyway and do incredible things. I mean, imagine if he had no pain, it'd be pretty much unstoppable. So um, absolutely, yeah, he's borderline that already, as we've seen in the two games that he's been returned. So. We'll see. Uh, I feel confident about Julius Randle more than I have at any other point this season. Just hearing that he's doing, you know, individual work. The, the Begley report is doing individual work and um, shooting, can do everything, light contact with pads, just needs to be clear for full contact. So the April 1st line is looking good, too, for that. We'll just see. To me, the biggest concern, the biggest Julius concern is if he comes back, gets dinged up a little bit, 
and then gets re-injured. That's I, I believe he's going to come back. I'm just not confident he won't go away again. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Um, and if you're wondering where the third member of the casual crew is, Mensa, uh, Mensa got fired yesterday on his day off for stealing boxes. So Mensa's <laughs> no longer with us. Um, if you know, you know where that reference is from. All right. No, Mensa hopefully will be joining us short, shortly. You know, life be life. And, um, but listen, with that, let's get to some questions. So this is, again, this is a mailbag. This is a mailbag. Ask us anything. We're going to ask them. Um, live, we're gonna ask them, answer them live, and um, all right. Let's first question is from the craft MBA. Hey, it's DJ from KFS. Hey, I know that guy. Uh, <laughs> what is the better outcome for New York? A stay in the four five and have home court versus Orlando, but in the Boston side of the bracket, or B mm-hmm. drop to six and play Cleveland without home court, but not see Boston until the Eastern Conference Finals. DJ, this is an amazing question because I actually thought about posting this question as a poll a few days ago. Um, like, what will be better? So, uh, actually, I will yield to you first unless you need some time to think about it. What What would be the better outcome? No, I need no time to think about this. Uh, I would rather drop to six and play Cleveland without home court advantage. Not a difficult question for me. A really good question, but not a difficult one for me because I think it really depends on what you want. If you want to advance to the second round and you want to kind of be quote unquote guaranteed to advance to the next round, then you probably would want to stay at four or five, have home court against Orlando. I think the Knicks would probably be like 70, 30 to win that series, maybe even more. So if you want to be like really assured to advance to the second round, then you probably want that outcome. For me, I want to see how far this team can go. And to get to the Eastern Conference final, it's going to require not playing Boston in the second round of the playoffs. So to me, that like it, this, this question is saying, would I want to guarantee for a second round appearance um, or would I want to a guarantee for a second round appearance and a guarantee not to make the Eastern Conference finals? Or would I want to have a chance to make the second round with a chance to make the Eastern Conference Finals? And I'd rather have a chance to make the Eastern Conference Finals any day of the week, especially with the squad that the Knicks have this year. So uh, it's pretty easily for B for me. But it's a really good question. Thanks for, uh, for that question, DJ. Yeah, so I so it's funny because I was in... I was on the part of the Hoop Spaces Daily Show on on playback early this week, and I was in there for guy. Shout out to my man Salty Magic fan, and he was talking cash. He was talking real, real quick. Cash. That's his. That's his name, Salty Magic fan. Yes, that's his name. He's <laughs> on Twitter, Salty name. Magic fan. Okay, um, got you. <laughs> oh even, no! I didn't. I didn't call him Salty Magic fan. I thought you were just Salty calling Magic. him Salty Magic fan. No. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, he's a salty magic fan, and he was talking cash shit before we played them and held them to 74 points in a game. Um, and then afterwards he was like, This doesn't matter. He's like, no one's scared of the Knicks, yada yada yada. And I told him, Salty, you're the team that everyone in the Eastern Conference wants in the first round. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boston, <laughs> Milwaukee, New York, Cleveland, Philly, Indiana, Miami, Miami. everybody <laughs> wants you. Like it's like it's like they say in poker. Like if you're sitting at a poker table and you're trying to find a sucker, you can't find it within 15 minutes. You're the sucker. It's like, you, <laughs> Orlando. It's you. Um, uh, with that said, part of me is like, you know what? Like, I'm gonna lean towards the the six because. Having the home court against Orlando, I mean, doesn't matter because we're going to have home court anyway, whether we're the four or the five, because it's in Orlando, and I think we will take care of them. Um, but like, you'd rather you you would rather avoid Boston at all costs if you can. Especially, listen, what if they're what if what if um, somehow Milwaukee drops a four and then takes them, or Cleveland drops a four, or not Cleveland, um. Milwaukee gets the four or something like that. Like, you know, things can happen. Um, yeah, but Cleveland, clearly we are – we're a bad matchup for them. Styles make fights. So I don't think we need home court advantage to beat Cleveland because we didn't need home court advantage last year to beat Cleveland. And we are a better team this year. And they're, they are – while they are better this year, Isaac Okoro can actually hit open threes now. Um, 
Sam Merrill, we saw in person, if you leave him open, it's a problem. Um, but no, 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 I don't care. So, because either way, we are <laughs> either because either way, we're you're not, if you whether you're four, five, or six, you're not going to have home corner the second round. So, get, yeah. get to the, get to round two, then you most likely get Milwaukee. And I would love seven games in Milwaukee where they don't, where, where Malik, Malik Beasley doesn't turn to Clay Thompson. So, just imagine, That's- Sean, imagine uh, Mitchell Robinson getting healthy just in time to start a Cavaliers series. <laughs> It's like uh, <laughs> two weeks before the Cavs series. They're like, and Mitchell Robinson is cleared for full contact practice. Like, what are those guys going to do? I feel like the the series is over in that moment if that happens, you know? I don't know. I, maybe I'm overconfident, but Cleveland is just, like, not not a concern. You should be overconfident. You have every right to be overconfident. So, um, listen, they, they did it to themselves. They absolutely did it to <laughs> themselves. Um, all right. What we got here next? Let's see here. Da, da, da. We go here. All right. So thank you, DJ. Appreciate it. Next. Ben Kim Gurvey. What's up, Ben? Uh, we spent a lot of time describing players in terms of their averages, but far less describing their variability. Is there a variance that out there? I will yield the floor. <laughs> one XJ. Yeah. Because this, this, is your, this, is, this is your wheelhouse, buddy. Go ahead. No, it's so funny. It, it, shout out BKG. It's so funny that you're asking this question, Ben, because I was just talking to my buddy Jeff about this very question. Like, I was like, is there a publicly available variance stat, especially for three point shooting, or do I have to like hand calculate variance? Which apparently there's not one. Neither of us could find it. That doesn't mean there's not one, but if he didn't know and i don't know and you don't know uh, bkg then i'm assuming there's not one and that's unfortunate because variance is really important to look at and i think that it matters a lot because when you get into a playoff series that's where it really shows its head we have a seven game series let's say we don't really want shooters who where it's like they could shoot 25 percent for the series or they could shoot 50 percent for the series unless we're the clear underdog. So against Boston, you probably do want that because you want a guy who's like, hey, if he gets hot at the right time, he may heat up and could help us win a series that we weren't expecting to win. If you're the better team or you think that you're a better team, you really just want things to go how you expect them to go. You want, you want them to go uh, kind of the average. That's what you like to see as opposed to the, the, the wide uh, fluctuations of variance. So it would be really cool to see that. Um, I have an inkling about particular guys that I watch a lot, but it would be really interesting to see if the like, eye test in that situation, like what I when I watch them, what if I think they're consistent or not, if that matches up with what we see from the data. So something that could be created not too difficult with not too much difficulty, but I don't know of a publicly available variant stat that is uh, reliable. So that's a good question. Great question. I mean, not that I'm the not that I'm an analytics guru, but like there's just so many things that's hard to measure, right? Um, and hope but listen, you never know. There may be one that's developed one one day, but it's really hard. That's something that you, that's hard to take. It's so, it's hard to account for, but you know, that's part of what makes sports sports. It's the it's the variables, it's the uncertainty, right? So um, maybe someone will figure it out. Who knows? And if they do, they'll make a lot of money. But until then, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> to be clear, Sean, they won't make a lot of money. I gotta say, <laughs> they'll they'll <laughs> they'll get a lot of uh, likes on Twitter. They will not make a lot of money off of it. But <laughs> well, what <laughs> but... if they sold it to like a second spectrum or a uh, or or the the league or something? That's what I mean. Like not like yeah, I got like, you. If yeah, so um, but I, I yes, but if yes, but if someone says hey on Twitter, hey, I created a stat variance, you'd be like, get out of here, nerd. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. That is what would happen. <laughs> BKG, thank you for the question. All right, next from Buzzer Beater. Oh man, should we jettison Burks and Boyan and add Mook? I'm assuming Mook is Marcus Morris. Um, we should not do that because. Players signed now are not eligible for the playoff roster. So, yes, we would sign Mook and maybe he'll help us come off the bench do some stuff. But then when it comes to playoff time, we'll have traded two players for one. And then that, and then basically we we'll, we would have traded two players. We'd be down three. We'd be down three guys in the playoffs. So um, we cannot add we cannot add Mook. But in a in a in, in, let's let's answer this question if there was no such rule. XJ, would you jettison Brooks and Boyan for uh, one Marcus Morris onto Nick Always and Nick? 
No, it's a, it's a valid question because of how bad Burks and Boyan have been, but but definitely not for me. Um, I Marcus Morris hasn't or wasn't good this year. I know he was dealing with like injuries, like some foot injury stuff. Um, but over on the net, he was pretty bad this year, and I think we'd probably see some similarities to what we're seeing from like a Alec Burks, for instance, a guy who's like you really just want him to spot up in the corner, but then he's kind of trying to do too much or may go away or if his shot's not going down then he's pretty much useless so um i am not the biggest fan of kind of the marcus morris type of situation i honestly his best years his best year as a pro was the year he played for the knicks and the clippers and he had a solid year the year after and then kind of went off on you know precipitously after that so i'm not a big fan um think he's 34 years old uh yes he's 34 years old gonna be 35 so I, I'm not too much into it. At the same time, I still have faith in Boyan. I'm not going to say too much about Burks because I'm not sure I have faith in Burks. But Boyan Bogdanovich, I still have faith in. Boyan Bogdanovich is going to hit shots. I, that's a big thing that I, I really am preaching. I'm very intrigued about lineups that feature Boyan and OG without Burks in them because I think that OG can potentially help mask a lot of the defensive deficiencies that Bogdanovich has. But as far as shooting – having those two guys in, in the corners is going to be deadly no matter what, no matter who he's out there with. We don't think of Deuce McBride as like a playmaker. We don't think of necessarily even like a Dante DiVincenzo as a playmaker or a Josh Hart. But if you have either either one of those three guys, if OG and, and Boyan Bogdanovich are both in the corners and you're running spread pick and rolls with those, with any of those um, you know primary initiators in that situation, if Jalen Brunson's on the court, you're going to have a lot of space to work with because Boyan Bogdanovich is going to make threes. I just want to say really quickly for the record, Bogdanovich three-point shooting the last several years, 40% from three, 41% from three, 39% from three, 39% from three, 41% from three, 43% from three, 40% from three. It, this guy, he's going to make shots. He's just going to. That's just that's just the reality. Um, and I think he'll turn it around because he's going to be put in better situations to really accentuate his skill set, which is hitting open shots, corner threes above the break, above the break three. So I, I would stick with him. I'm not, I'm not out on boy on yet. Burks. Don't ask me about Burks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, GMAC tweeted yesterday or last night, uh, uh, hell happened to you Burks. And I just retweeted it with the dude saying Detroit basketball. Like we need like, I don't know how Alec, my man. I don't know how many showers you have to take to wash this thing off. <laughs> I don't know. Like, but please, like, maybe we need a different soap. Maybe like a tea tree oil soap, a peppermint oil soap, or something like that. Like, um, to Boyan, and I guess this kind of this kind of uh relate to Burks as well because, um. I remember because, you know, we saw like Brooks is doing very well in Detroit from a, you know, statistical standpoint. Um, but I re always remember uh, years ago, this is like 20 years ago when um, Glenn Rice, uh, Glenn Rice was went to the Lakers from, I forget either the Hornets or the Heat. I forget, I think it was the Hornets. And my friend Dorian, big Laker fan, and they're like, oh, we got Glenn Rice because Glenn Rice was average like 22 points a game. And he gets to LA. And he can barely score. And my friend is like, y'all don't understand this. dude's a bum. I don't understand it. How could he's like, he was 22 a game over there. How could he, can't, he can't hit the brush up? He can't hit nothing. And my other best friend, Allie, was like, well, when you go from taking 25 shots a game, 20, 20 to 22 shots a game to like 12, like what, like that, like. When you miss your first three shots, but you know you're getting 20, it's like, all right, well, I'm going to get 17. When you miss your first three shots and you're only getting eight, it, it can affect it can affect you because you don't you don't get that, you don't get that, you don't get that time. I think that's what that could be what's affecting Bogey to a certain extent. Burks, I he's is he just going through a slump? Like I I remember uh CP and Alex from Knicks Fan TV had a back and forth about it on their post games. And Alex and CP's like, he's just in a slump. And uh, Alex was like, nah, this dude isn't good. And he's like, just give it time. And time is passing. But then again, I, is he going to break out of his slump getting five minutes a game? It almost reminds me of like, like what they did, to, what Tibbs did to Elf. Like it went from 
regular minutes to like 15 minutes, like 10 minutes to five minutes. It's like, you might just have to put him out of his misery. Um, <laughs> like there, I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Buzzer Peter. Uh, I can uh, read we, this one. I can read yeah, this one. Yes. Sean, you're doing all, you're doing all the heavy lifting. I got you. I got you. We can, uh, yeah, let's alternate. Let's alternate. We, we, we got this super chat from this guy, this guy named Andrew Claudio. Uh, appreciate the, the, the co- contribution, Andrew Claudio. Casual Friday on an actual Friday. Let's go. Wow. You know what? For some, I'm so dumb. I didn't even think about that. Like it is actually a casual Friday that we're recording yes. uh, a, a live on a Friday. Normally we record casual Fridays on a Thursday. So, you know, it feels good. It feels good to actually be here on a casual Friday with you, Sean. Missing Mensa, but hopefully he joins us any minute now and, and we can get going full force. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, shout out to Andrew Claudio, whoever that guy is. He probably seems like an interesting fan. Oh, we have another one from Andrew Claudio. <laughs> um, this guy must be a fan. Important questions for both. <laughs> I was going to say, wait till you read it. <laughs> Important questions for both of you. In your expert opinions, rank the following. <laughs> yeah, this is the question the of the following- night. <laughs> Detroit artists, Dilla, Eminem, Dr. <laughs> Dre, Quentin Grimm. I mean, okay. Yeah, you go first, Sean. You go first. Okay. Um, so I would rank, um, I, in terms of artists, I would rank J. Dilla 1, Eminem 2, Quentin Grimes 3, and then Dr. Dre not applicable because newsflash dr dre is not <laughs> from detroit but if he were <laughs> so i just there's a world because well there's, there's actually two americas that are probably not gonna know what this reference is all i'm gonna say is if you want to go get informed just go to twitter type in the search bar dilla see a tweet with a ton of quote tweets an article <laughs> with a ton of quote tweets and that'll fill you in there you go yes um Yes. So, yeah. Shout out Jay Dilla. May he rest in peace. Um, but would you like to rank these Detroit artists, uh, XJ? Yeah, I want to say I want to say um, there's got to be a loophole here because Dr. Dre is Dr. Dre like an honorary Detroit artist for finding Eminem. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, not bad, I, that's not a bad, not, not a bad shout. Um, I would say. Between Jay Dilla and Eminem, that's kind of tough to me. I honestly, I, I probably go Jay Dilla. So I I used to produce music, um, hip hop, and I started doing like I started out doing like kind of like boom bap type sample type beats. So I you know Jay Dilla is a huge influence. Obviously, I remember getting like a Jay Dilla drum kit and just going crazy with that and being like, yo, this sounds so fire. So I is he's a huge influence on me generally, but also you know Eminem is Eminem is 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 Eminem. So, um, but I would probably say, for that reason, I would probably say Jay Dilla, Eminem, Quentin Grimes. I'd probably have like your same. Is that the same ranking that you had, Sean? Yeah. All right, we, we we're probably on the same page um, with Dr. Dre being an honorary uh, <laughs> Detroit artist in, in this case. Um, good question. Shout out to Dr. Dre. David Crockett, um, Royce to five nine better than all of them. GMAC, huh? Royce well, is really good, okay. and, and honestly, yeah. Royce's like recent, more recent work has elevated him a lot more and got him a lot more prestige. So I, I think his longevity is kind of really impressive and underrated. I think, but I don't know. I don't know. This is all tough for me. I, it's hard for me to say Royce is like way better than both Dilla and Eminem. That's kind of that's pushing it for me. Well, I mean, uh, so I mean, Dilla was more of a a um, producer, as a producer, so, yeah, yes, as I a mu- as yeah, a musician. So, now, if you want to talk about Royce versus Eminem, I mean, obviously Eminem has had the longevity and the commercial success, but like lyrically, Royce can hold his own. And honestly, we are the only like like there's a there's a whole Gen Z that's probably wondering who the hell's Royce the Five Nine. Do your research, <laughs> damn it. Um, Royce the Five Nine can spit. As a rapper, I can understand what he's saying. He doesn't mumble. <laughs> Get off my lawn. Next question. That's true. I forgot. I forgot about that. You're right. We don't want to hear what they actually have to say, I guess. 
All right, David Crockett again. Shout out to the Carazzo crew. What has left me jaw dropped on Boyo is the turnovers and near turnover grenades. I'm concerned about all hmm. non shooting. Um, I'm guessing Boyo is, is bogey. Yeah, is, is, is Boyan. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I mean, defensively, we knew it was going to be a it was, that we were going to take a step back, but you hope the offense would. Um, you hope the offense would, you know, cover up for it. Um, to your point that you made earlier, XJ, you know, if you have Boyan in the corner and like OG in another corner or, or, or Burks, if he ever grows a jump shot again, in the other corner offensively is going to be a mate is, is going to be problems um, defensively. Um, and I thought we get a little bit more secondary playmaking from Boyan. Someone could put the ball mm-hmm. on the floor, old man his way to the basket, what have you. You want to say he's trying to find a rhythm? I mean, that's fine. I mean, he joined the team, and Tibbs is playing him like 30 minutes off the rip, you know, because we're down like eight guys. And, you know, he's also 34 years old. He And to be honest, he doesn't know all the plays. Like, uh, I think DJ clipped it when he was like, there was a play where him and Deuce end up in the, in, in, in the same spot in the corner. So he's probably struggling there. I mean, we also do tend to underestimate how these trades can affect players, you know, you know, in terms of, you know, the family and, you know, changing, you know, where you live and your lifestyle and things like that. So um, I'm concerned, but I'm going to give it time. I'm going to give it time because it, it, it's, it's really the playoffs. So we're going to see what he, how he can contribute. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think the turnovers don't necessarily make me that worried. And I will say Boyan Bogdanovich has always been a relatively high turnover guy, not like a crazy turnover guy, but in terms of his turnover percentage, like he gives it up a bit, but because he has like some playmaking duties in most cases. And um, I think that to me, the biggest thing for Boyan is one, like you said, Sean, and like DJ had mentioned, he doesn't really seem to know the play. He seems to get lost in, in a lot of cases. But another thing is that what we Knicks fans, you know, have loved what Precious Achua has brought to the table, and he's been really excellent in the role and, and everything they've asked him to do. But they haven't asked him to do very much. They very much simplified his role. They said, "Go get rebounds uh, on both ends of the ball and play really good on-ball defense against big threes and and fours." And <clears throat> he's done those things extremely well and kind of chipped in in other places where he can. But I think that. Boyan needs his role simplified as well. I think he needs to just be like planted in the corner, the full corner boy Obi Toppin roll and just stand there um, and or run high pick and rolls, you know, with this floor spaced out and be able to kind of get to the basket that way or um, be able to play make that way. So to me, I feel like you got to kind of make Boyan Bogdanovich say like, forget about the playbook. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to stand there. You're going to make shots when you get the ball and you're open or you're going to have the ball in your hands or you're going to have a high pick and roll and be able to create out of that. So I think you really need to simplify his role. It seems like they've done that a little bit, but I, I do think he's being asked to do like a little bit too many things. And um, I think in order to capitalize on his his skill set, you're really going to have to just like hone in on the things that he does extremely well and be like, only do those things. So I, I'm not so much worried about the turnovers. He's been to be clear, he's been terrible as a Nick, so I don't want to sugarcoat it at all. I just think I just think I would give him time, and I think he's going to bounce back. Fair, fair enough. I think we all agree. There hey. they are. Hey guys, welcome, how we doing? Welcome, welcome. Can we you guys hear me? Okay, how? Perfect, perfect. No, we can't hear you at all. Ah, that's tough. No, we can hear you. No, I we can oh. hear you. <laughs> I was like, don't trick, don't don't fool the man. He has his son (laughs) in his hands. Come on now. That little guy. Hey. 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 Hello. Look at him. Yeah, this is my guy, Emery. He's, uh, what, three months old? Uh, I want to say like, what, 16, 17 weeks at this point? You lose track after after you get in the months. Um, Yeah, this is is the guy. Yeah. Doing some uh, live podcasting, live dadding. Uh, I want to shout out everybody for joining us this Friday evening. Um, yeah, and this is this is the kid. This is <laughs> that's amazing. Emery is this is like the youngest podcaster in the history of podcasting. In can the we, history, <laughs> can we make a, an appeal to Guinness World Records if that's still a thing? And and three months that's crazy. Listen, listen, he's breaking records very early <laughs> on. I'm a proud and, of that. Hey, uh, we got Zach with an H like here too. Son. It's like my son is a hater. I was like, wait a minute, we can't wait in the I'm the first kid of KFS <laughs> of Casual Friday. Hello. Say um, hi. 
Hi, people. Hey, happy birthday so too, Zach. Yeah, happy birthday. Oh yeah, they say happy they say happy birthday to you. Thank you. Um, oh, we need we need Zach to confirm if he if he really gets his haircut at the same barbershop that Isaiah Hardenstein oh, gets okay. his haircut. Okay. So right. ask him. Actually, don't don't prep him, Sean. Don't I'm prep him prep first. Him. I'm not gonna prep him. I'm not gonna prep him. Okay. <laughs> who who goes to who is one name one person name one other person in the world who goes to the same barbershop as you? Isaiah Hartenstein. Bang uh, bang. All right. Single Street Gang. All early. Right. <laughs> Wait, I want to ask Zach who his five favorite Detroit rappers are. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get to the bottom of this, fellas. We could just Dr. Ask, Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre, yeah. Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre. Easy. Spits hot fire. Yes. <laughs> for just for just for representation purposes, we got to go Eminem Proof Slum Village. Um Jay Dilla, shout out to Jay Dilla, not really a rapper. Big Sean, um, that's what Quentin four Gr people. Quentin uh, and, and Quentin Grimes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was a question that some idiot super chatter put up. So, um, okay, some guy, we're gonna continue with the show with uh, a couple more questions now that Mensa is is all aboard. Yes, sir. Mensa, David Crockett had put out uh, Royce, and you left out Royce. So I don't know. If... Oh, of course, Royce the five nine. How I, I didn't forget? know if that was intentional or not. So how could I forget? Shout out the whole Slaughterhouse click. Yep. Shout out Slaughterhouse. All right, uh, Brian Valderrama. We're all saying the questions, um, Mensa. So you can go next. Um, you can read the next one. Boya and Burks might seem lost now, but I can see them making an impact in the playoffs. Who could you see struggling in the playoffs like IQ did? Hmm. That's a good question. There's hmm. an there is an answer that everyone knows that I am not going to put out in the universe. <laughs> so, because that's low hanging fruit. Um, so I'm gonna move past him, but who would struggle in the who would So you're gonna leave us playoffs? with him? Because I know no, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm thinking. So if you if y'all have a name, you could throw out. If you don't have a name, then actually I have a name, but I will, I will, I will yield the floor. So I, if I'm thinking about the playoffs, I'm gonna assume the Knicks are healthy. And so I think hopefully that's that's the assumption going into it. So I I was gonna say a name. But I don't think this that player is going to play very much. The name I was going to say is Precious Achua, and I'll just say it because if he, if he does play, and I think that there's a potential for teams to exploit him as a rim protector. Um, I think we could see that happen if he plays. You know, let's say Mitch Mitch is not back and he plays a lot of minutes behind Hardenstein. Um, I like Precious at the five over Precious at the four, so uh, that's really I, I'm very clear on that stance. But at the same time, I do think there's a potential for him to be exploited at the rim. Um, and if they play him at the four, I, I think that's that's a disaster waiting to happen. So I, I feel like, depending on how the rotations are, it could be precious. And I'll I'll just say him for now. But yeah. I'll go next. Um, okay. Oh, go ahead, man. go ahead, Mensa. Yeah. Um, I think the easy answer is Deuce McBride. Um, just because this is really his first year as a like rotation player, being relied upon heavily, and one thing that. Um, kind of well, not really leaves, but I can see him struggling to like hit open shots just because of the nerves, not wanting to mess things up. Um, Tibbs having a notoriously short leash. Um, I can see Deuce McBride having a bit of struggles the same way IQ did, had some struggles, you know, as a um, young guard. Um, the one difference is that IQ was relied upon to create, and I don't think Deuce will have the same creation duties. He'll really be more catch and shoot and uh, defense. So um, I don't think he's as likely as IQ was, and I didn't even think IQ was likely to struggle. But um, that's that's who I would lean is Deuce McBride, just because, you know, he's a young guy, um, relied upon, and he's definitely ahead of um, Alec Burks in the rotation, so we're going to need him to stay there. Um, but I, that's why I would, if anybody, I would have to say him, Deuce McBride. To, to your point real quick, Mensa, he also, we did see him struggle a little bit making the shift from the G League to the to the big leagues. So there, we have some evidence to say that, like, kind of moving up a little bit in terms of intensity, he had he has struggled with his shot in those circumstances. So it's a good call. So the person I was gonna go, I'm gonna go with is Josh Hart, but it's for these reasons: 44, 41, 41, 40, 47, 45, 43, 42, 43, 39, 41. Is that My his three point shooting percentages? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> and 
if they'll if they'll if that was his three point shooting percentage the last eleven games, that would be amazing. But unfortunately, those are the minutes he's played the last eleven games, and my concern would be that he may be wiped by playoff time. That's my only concern. Um, and I'm surprised no one took the low hanging fruit and said um, number thirty from the New York Knicks, Julius Randle. Um, but we 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 don't lean this in narratives. Well, we lean into certain narratives, but we're not leaning into that one. We like to give the benefit of the doubt. So, uh, thank you, Brian, for your question. Amory, you can read this one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, uh, for oh, the actually, kid. Actually, no. I'll read. I'll I'll read this one. You can get the next one. This is CT Pittman. Uh, here hashtag here we go as showing for W. Uh, hashtag here we go. That is the uh hashtag of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, because C.T. Pittman, who's been a longtime supporter of Knicks Film School, we love him very much. Even though we love him, he hates himself because he roots for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So he's here celebrating the fact that his team thinks they're going to return to glory by signing a quarterback that was washed up two years ago, Russell Wilson. But that's neither here nor there. So um, good luck going 9-8 again next year, C.T. I love you. All right. We'll go to the next one. Thank you, C.T. <laughs> So just CT, I'm which I, I like that was fun and that banter was like great. And you guys back and forth is good, good natured. I just speak on behalf of Mensa. It could always be worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said that he um he hates himself for rooting for the Steelers. Um, you're told I'm a Jets fan. Uh, it could <laughs> if, always if he be hates worse. himself, then um yeah. I must have the lowest opinion of your my quarterback own self. isn't running for for vice president, so there. <laughs> OK, I, Russell Wilson might not be able to scramble as much as he he used to, but he also didn't have to ask AI to write an apology on Twitter yesterday. OK, we can continue. I, I will say it, it, this sounds like the old adage of is it better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all? Like, the is answer it better- is it is it's better to not be a Jets fan. <laughs> The answer, the answer to every part. question, I think. By the way, I didn't say y'all didn't hate yourselves. I just said C.T. Pittman hated himself. All right. <laughs> right now, I hate everything, Shaw. <laughs> All right, next up. Okay, go Fargo ahead. Tufo, thank you for the contribution, my friend. Um, why don't I have anything to do better to do on a Friday? Um, I personally think you're doing something great because there's this really cute baby on screen. And yes, sir. He's very awesome, as you can see. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you could be doing a lot worse things than looking at awesome, cute babies uh, wearing orange. Um, but, yeah, no, we're, we're grateful that you're here. Um, there, I'm pretty sure there are a billion Twitter spaces or a billion podcasts that you could be listening to. But you're here with us to talk basketball about the New York Knicks at a really pivotal juncture for the team. You know, guys are getting healthy. Um, there's so much. There are so many good things to talk about the New York Knicks. Um, if it was like 2019 or 2018 and we were discussing the merits of playing Kadeem Allen or like signing Alfred Payton, then all right, I would agree with you. But talking Knicks on a Friday night, not the worst thing you could be doing in the year 2024. Bro, I remember saying to myself, ooh, Langston Galloway, we might have something here. How far we have come. How far we have come. Thank you. Thank you, Fargo Tufo, a.k.a. I think Fargo. that's original Alex. All right. XJ, you're up. David Crockett again. What up, David? Uh, shout out to Aaron Donald on his retirement. Does anybody want to want to take this? Fo- we, we segued fully into football talk. Does anybody want to <laughs> take, take this I'll take this one. Um, <laughs> shout out to Aaron Donald, maybe the greatest defensive tackle of all time. And I'm saying maybe because I don't – I haven't done the research. Um, I'm pretty sure he's – Three-time defensive player of the year, uh, what, seven All-Pros, nine Pro Bowls in 10 seasons. This guy was like the Barry Sanders of defensive tackles if Barry Sanders had playoff success. Um, But I do want to take this time and opportunity to shout out Chris Perzianen, who called this two days ago. Um, Young kid, hasn't even graduated college yet, has sources in multiple sports, and we are lucky to call him a colleague. Um, Shout out Chris Perzianen for calling that. Um, listen, if you're watching this and you have connections at a place, look, that kid's looking for a job. Um, let's, let's get him hired. Let's, let's build this kid because come on now to call that from where he's at is, is awesome. And I didn't see, I didn't see Schefter. I didn't see uh Rappaport. I didn't see any of those guys on it, but he had it. So shout out to him. 
Shout out Chris Procyana for real, for real. And when you be, and when you and when you take Mike Breen's job in twenty thirty seven, don't forget about the little people like us. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, 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 good call. Shout out Chris. Um, is this one me or is this one you, Sean? Uh, you, you want to read it? Go ahead. From Buzzer Beater XJ, you mentioned before a specific stat that you use to evaluate teams. Which one is it? To evaluate teams, uh, I mean, so for teams, I typically will look at uh, off offensive and defensive ratings, uh, but typically I'll also look at um, the adjusted offensive and defensive ratings, either their strength of schedule adjusted, so looking at kind of like how good the teams are that the teams have been playing, that, that can help, but the adjustments are typically not huge based on strength of schedule. Um, there's a couple of stats out there that are offensive and defensive ratings luck adjusted so typically that adjusts for like how well teams are shooting from three those can be hit or miss but they actually can be a lot more telling i think than than uh regular offensive rating or strength of schedule adjusted offensive rating so those are three different types of the same stat that i might look at um so I, maybe that's what you're talking about i that's probably the best way to evaluate teams as a whole uh, anything else is not really highly correlated with like overall team success. I mean, some teams are great at offensive rebounding and, and, and bad at other things. You know, we know one, um, some teams are great at, you know, offensive efficiency and scoring on the first try and bad at rebounding. So, you know, a lot of teams have their strengths and weaknesses, you know, the things that they're proficient at and deficient at, but none of those things are really super highly correlated with overall team success. The most highly correlated team stat with team success is truly just like net rating, which tells you how good a team is actually doing when they play other teams in terms of the final score. So that's kind of what I look at the most. Excellent answer, XJ. Um, excellent answer. Appreciate it. And both of you, thank you. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the uh, question. All right, Danny G. Who do we re? <laughs> this is a fo- this is a football question. Wait a minute. I okay, I'm assuming this is a basketball <laughs> question because it's from Danny G. And he has a giant logo of his avatar. It says, "Who do we sign next year from our free agents?" So, uh, who will? Well, okay. So that will be Boyan, Burks. Uh, I, who else? Is, I don't think Boyan is a free agent. Boyan still is under, is probably on their contract. Oh yeah, no, he has year, one year. Right? Yes, they have one year. He has one year left. I think both of them. Because that's why yeah. he's continuous soup. Um, he's for, continuous soup. They're both yeah. continuous soup, right? No, um, I think I think I, Burks is out. Um, actually, you know who else is a free agent? Isaiah Hartenstein is a free agent. Yeah. Um, Precious Achua. Uh, Precious Achua. So we're looking at uh, we're looking at Burks, Precious, and Ihart. Um, who do we resign? So I, have I think said, those are it. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking. At, yeah, I have said that. I don't think we re. I don't think we keep both Precious and iHeart. One of them has to go because I think iHeart. Uh, excuse me, Precious has played himself into some decent, decent money. Not you know, not. Jock Landale, Landale money, but decent money, right? Excuse me. And I heart, like I listen, I my fear, and we've discussed this in the KFS chat, I've discussed it with Jeremy. Like, my fear is that someone's gonna give him a bag um this year this year. Um, and for the record, these are uh to confirming that our free agents this summer are Burks, Hartenstein, and Precious has a, I believe, a team option. Yo, he's always, yeah, he, yeah, he, and, and and Precious, that's it. Um, and then like you know, Daquan Jeffries, Jacob Toppin, you know, stuff like that. Uh, oh, oh, Shake Milton, free agent. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like, I feel like someone's gonna give iHeart a bag. And if you ask me who's the one person who's the one free agent, I don't think we'll be in the team next year. I feel like it's gonna be iHeart. Like I think again, if Jack Lawndale got Landale got. I think he got like four for 32. Like, and Isaiah Hartenstein's getting eight million a year now. Someone can offer this dude four years, $48 million. And I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I don't know if we're going to the apron for, to, to bring back Hartenstein. So I think it's one or the other. And especially, actually, to your point about Precious's viability as a five, 
Maybe they just say, all right, you know, we'll bring pressure back on a decent two-year deal, one year for team option and a lower number, and we'll just, we'll just roll that way. I was going to say real quick, Sean, because I kind of agreed with you uh, that te- a team out there may want to pay Hardenstein, but I kind of think the injury stuff is going to scare teams away a little bit and allow the Knicks to still swoop in and get them under what we might think the market value could be. I think it's a little scary seeing this guy who, you know, last year, even though he played all the games, was dealing with a, a same kind of nagging injury for the beginning of the season. And now we're seeing him deal with it repeatedly throughout the season. And you may think like that eight, that Achilles is going to go at some point, you know, knock on wood. Obviously we hope it's not true, but I just think that you, you not knowing that situation could scare teams off. Teams are not going to want to commit to him to be like their full-time starting five. And if he's going to be a backup, I don't think he's going to make that much money. So to me, I think the Knicks are the one team who can afford to ha- to pay him a reasonable amount at the five because we have a guy named Mitchell Robinson who's making like backup money nearly at the five as their starter. So I think I could imagine the Knicks being able to kind of get Hardenstein. I'm sure he's happy in New York. You know, he seems like he's he be, he be a guy who's happy in New York. And also, I mean, his role has been amazing. And so I think he could be offered – a similar role, you know, splitting it with his best buddy, Mitchell Robinson, potentially. I, I think the Knicks have a lot to offer besides just the dollar amount. And I think that teams may be scared a little bit by his health situation. So I think the Knicks could still keep him. That's the guy I would go for, for sure. Uh, over Precious Achua, even if the disparity in the amount is like really substantial, I would still pay Hardenstein. Yeah, same. Um, I think Hartenstein, like with the with the Achilles tendinopathy, and I think last year having an um an Achilles injury as well, um that should scare teams off from making a major investment in him. Uh, I personally think that he is worth more money than he will get. I think that Hartenstein, just his defensive value, and then what he gives you on the offensive end as well is worth. Personally, I think is worth at least twenty one million. AAV. Um, he's probably going to get something closer to 13 and 14. I think um, Jeremy shared it in, in the um, the faculty chat. I forgot who actually tweeted. I think it was like Keith Smith or one of those guys. Um, that's where he's projected to make. And the, the good thing is centers are like running backs almost uh, to keep with the, uh, the cross sport analogy. Teams don't really value them the same way, even though they're crucial to a successful team's operation in football. If you can't run the ball, you don't have a really good offense in basketball. If you can't protect the paint, you don't have a great defense. Um, So even if these guys do come in spades, they're very valuable. And Isaiah Hartenstein, last I checked, is still the most impactful. Uh, It was Bobby Marks. Thank you, XJ, for pointing that out. Not um, Keith, um, Keith Smith, who estimated Isaiah Hartenstein's salary being around 13, 14 million. Um, but yeah, Isaiah Hartenstein is to me and to defensive EPM, the most impactful big in the game. And that's really important. So, um, I love personally, I think that his, he's invaluable with, um, I, I'll keep saying it, DiVincenzo and Anobi and Hartenstein are the, the best trio of role players in the NBA. Um, and I'll, and I'll continue to say that. I don't think that it's even close at this point when you really like look around the league, um, He's the one guy that I could see them bringing back for sure. Another guy, uh, Precious Achua, absolutely. Um, Alec Burks is as good as gone. Um, Boyan is not. Yeah, so it's really just those, just the centers. I can see Achua coming back on a really, like a really team friendly deal, um, especially because he hasn't had success in the league. Um, he played for he played for Spo, didn't have much success. Played for Nick Nurse and uh, the the new guy in Toronto. Now he met Tibbs, and you know he has a role here. And even if right now he's just a middle innings reliever, maybe he might be a more impactful offensive player by next season than just sticking in New York. He um, grew up in the Bronx. He's Nigerian um, by passport, I believe. So yeah, I'm just really those are the two guys that I can see it. Um, Isaiah Hartenstein. Um, around uh, 14 to 16 million um, average annual value and um, Precious. I can't see Precious getting more than three to $4 million on open market. So he'll probably take that to stay here. And the last thing I want to say about this is this is New York. This is a contending team and it's New York. Um, I can't drive that home. These guys are in a big market and they're on a winning team. It's going to be hard to take our free agents away from us for a team like uh, Detroit or a Charlotte or a San Antonio 
they're going to have to blow the doors off because they're low. They're, they're much smaller markets and they're um, rebuilding basketball teams to put it kindly. Absolutely. Um, the one counterpoint I would say to teams being scared off of Isaiah Hartenstein's injury issues here is that they'll say, well, our head coach won't play Isaiah Hartenstein 29 minutes, 29 minutes in a row. So <laughs> maybe if we manage him better, it'll be, it'll go better. Um, but um, really quickly, there is one other free agent uh, that we forgot. That is OG Ananobu. He has a player option for this year. Although I am pretty damn certain that he is going yeah. to opt out because <laughs> he knows there is a deal waiting for him on the table. So if if now that dude ain't on our team next year, oh boy. Um, just want to give a big shout out to the over 680 people rock with us on a Friday night on what is a very nice day in the New York metropolitan area. Actually, I don't want to hear it. The weather's always nice there. Shut up. Not um, nice. So, it's 90 degrees today, guys. 90 degrees. It's not nice. It's getting too hot, but continue. Bro, listen, man. I, look, I'm supposed to go to uh, Austin for work next week. I want it to be 90 because there is a pool at the hotel that I'm staying at. So let's get it. Let's go global warming. All right. Next up, uh, Mensa, go ahead. Knock yourself out. All right, BKG, thanks for the contribution, my friend. Um, always love to see you active in the KFS, um, chat and everything. Happy to, to, to be doing this with you tonight. Um, okay, so let's read your question. Who do you see as the weak link for Boston? How do you think we should go about taking advantage of him? Why isn't your answer KP and attacking him to get in foul trouble? That was actually my answer, but because you said it wouldn't be my answer, I'm going to have to say that the weak link, would have to be their oldest starter when everybody's healthy, and that's Drew Holiday. He hasn't been himself or the Drew Holiday that I remember as recently as last season. I don't have the stats in front of me, but out of all those guys, like Derek White's a machine, uh, Jalen Brown playing really well. I don't have to talk about Jason Tatum. He's um, not an MVP candidate, but just right underneath that, so maybe like a Devin Booker level player, even like maybe a Paul George, like a top uh, 12 to well, top like 16 to nine guy in the league. Um, so definitely not Jason Tatum. And then poor Zingas, who I think I will believe that he will stay healthy for the entirety of a season. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. So I just, I think they've had incredible injury luck for the players that they have on their team. They've been able to keep it relatively healthy in Boston. So you can really say any one of those guys other than Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and Derek White. So I would say either Drew Holiday or um, Porzingis. And those are the guys that um, make that team special. Like they, because those are your fourth and fifth best starters, it's just an embarrassment of riches out there in Boston. So yeah, for me, it's Drew Holiday. Just think that he's um, starting to lose a step. A little bit, and then if I can't say, and and I'm only saying Drew Holiday because I can't say Chris Dapps Porzingis because I do think attacking him to get into foul trouble, even though he's he's excellent when he's on the court. Um, I wonder how he against the New York Knicks. I wonder how he will handle um the rough and tumble front court that we have with um with uh Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein, and then we always have the chess piece advantage of putting OG Ananobi on him for one or two possessions in the fourth quarter if he's hot. So, um, yeah, Chris Porzingis and Drew Holiday would be my answer. Yeah, I think those are good answers for sure, and I, I totally hear Ben's point about getting Porzingis in foul trouble. I will say I think it's a little harder to get players and to target them and get them in foul trouble than it it kind of seems like. So Kristaps right now, I, th I think this is accurate. That is, he is averaging 2.74 fouls per game. Um, so we're talking about needing to have those, his what he's an averaging for an entire game kind of in the first two quarters. And you can do it, but I wouldn't want the Knicks to kind of get out of their offense trying to figure out how to draw fouls on Kristaps to get him off the court just to get Al Horford in, who does, you know, a poor man's version of Kristaps Porzingis and, and, and brings like a different strength, potentially can help their rebounding a little bit even more than Kristaps does. So I'm not sure uh, as far as like strategically what's best. It might it might be the best option. I don't really know how you attack this Boston team. I'm going to obviously put it out there. Who the weakest link is to me, I I would probably agree with you, Mensa, and say Drew Holiday. 
The only thing about Drew Holiday is that this year he's also like shooting the best of his entire career, which is really frustrating <laughs> because he would have been the weak link, but he's also shooting 44% from three. He's actually in the 98th percentile in shooting percentage in the NBA right now. Um, the thing is he's not doing anything else very well on the offensive end besides shooting. So his defense is still there, not quite as elite as he has been, but when you put him with Derek White, the backcourt's just a menace, and the fact that one of them shooting 44% and one of them shooting 40% from three, I, it's it's hard to it's hard to call it a weakness. Um, and then Jalen Brown, who used to be my go-to for this for this question, has been probably playing the best basketball of his career recently. So um, he's become almost elite from the mid-range. He is able to kind of pick up the slack when Tatum's not playing well. So. I don't have a good answer. I mean, it's got to be the weak link has to be the weak links, which is their bench all, all overall. So anytime Peyton Pritch is in the game, anytime Sam Hauser's in the game, um, you got to take advantage of those guys and just hope that you dominate them in those minutes and then try to play them even in the other minutes. But tough to say who like a weak link, a, a weak link is for that Boston team. I figured out who the weak link is, but I'll let Sean jump in. So for me, the weak link is not one person, but it's their depth. I don't. I, I I like to say that the legacy of the 2011 Miami Heat was that you can't win a championship of eight guys, and Peyton Pritchard, Sam Hauser. Yes, if you leave Sam Hauser open, it's a problem. You know, who hit shots for like Xavier Tillman, Luke Cornett, uh, Al Horford, who's again who played in the 2007 NCAA Men's National Championship game. Um, I think it's the depth. I think it is if 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 Joe Mazzula can't trust those guys to provide quality minutes, then it's gonna be a lot. There's gonna be a then it's gonna be a heavier burden on the Drew Holidays who's been around a while, on the Chris Asporzingas, who again is not necessarily most sturdy when it comes to health. Uh that's why I think that's why I think the the weak link is their their depth or lack thereof. So to quote um, Nick's um, Nick's fan, Kendrick Perkins, if you put Joe Mazzula's brain in a bird, the brain the bird might fly backwards. Um, so I'm gonna have to say the weak link is gonna be in a in a playoff series is gonna be Joe Mazzula. He will likely be the worst head coach, um, pretty much in any series I can think of. Like if they get Miami in the first round, um, suppose a better coach than Mazzula. Um, if they get us in the second round, Tibbs is a better coach. Even Doc Rivers is a better coach than him, unless they somehow play. Um, I mean, Bickerstaff is even better than him. Like, I can't think of a team. I can't think of an actual, like a, a realistic matchup where the Boston Celtics will have the coaching advantage. And does that matter a lot? Obviously not, because they're the best team in basketball. But um, that, that I think that would be their weak link is that you can – you can count on, well, not count on, but you may have an opportunity where you see if the Boston Celtics lose, it's because they were out coached by a better coach than Joe Missoula. I, I want to ask you about that. Cause I, I actually think Missoula's, uh, it's funny because I'm, you and I agree a ton, Mensa. I think Missoula's a really good coach. So I'm I'm curious what makes you feel like he's so I, I I think in the past he's been bad in terms of his clock management and in strat like in game um, strategy and and kind of adjustments and I think he's improved a lot over the course of like just this season and I, I've always been a fan of his like philosophy obviously they take a million threes and they have a five out offense and I I love that he's always trying to keep Kristaps close to the rim which I think makes a ton of sense and, and they do a lot to make that happen like even we've seen some of the strategic things that they've whipped out with like Drew Holiday playing on Embiid or playing on Jokic, you know, like different kinds of things that you'll see him go to as he's, you know, just develop more confidence over his time in the NBA. So I feel like this was the answer last year and this year I feel completely differently about it. So I'm not sure if, if that you would agree with that or you think that like he's still showing those same signs as he did last year. Yeah, I mean, the the Missoula thing is just grasping at straws, to be honest, because there's no, like, to his credit, he's coaching the best team in basketball. Um, A lot of that has to do with the talent. He has a bunch of talented guys on his roster, but he's even been able to mitigate, like, the, um, the, 
the decline of a Drew Holiday by putting him in a system where he's shooting a career best from three, right? So Missoula's been coaching really well, but it is um, – the thing about the playoffs is a lot of things that work in the regular season don't necessarily work in the postseason, not because that you don't have good ideas, but how many good ideas do you have? Do you have the ability to respond to another coach's um another coach's adjustments, right? And Joe Mazzulla just being um basic, he's still like what in his he's on his second year as a coach, right? Um, look, sometimes you get lucky and you get a guy like Steve Kerr who can win a championship in his rookie year, but that's not everybody, right? Um, so with Joe Mazzulla, the reason why I say he would be the weak link is a lot of people do like you like the strategy, right? With the the shooting three pointers. A lot of people see the value in it, but also see like, hey, at some point the shots aren't going to fall and who are you then? And that, I feel like that's where people are starting to um, like, look at Joe Missoula and say, Hey, what's going to happen when you're in a dog fight and your guys aren't shooting threes. Are you going to be able, is Jason Tatum going to fall back into his bad habits? Are you going to coach him out of those bad habits? Are we going to rely on Derek white? Are we going to rely on Jalen Brown? And I think just because there's so many unknown answers in terms of Joe Missoula, as a head coach in high leverage moments. And we saw him struggle mightily in those moments. Um, like there's the, the just the, I, I forget how long he went in a, in a playoff game last year. I think it was like Eastern Conference Finals where it was like a, a crazy run and he did not call a timeout. So the um, the clock management issues are very real and, and, and they will be until they're not. It's a lot like um, Julius Randle, right? Where we don't believe in Julius Randle as a playoff performer until he does it in the playoffs. Same thing with Joe Mazzula. Um, so there's a lot to be encouraged about with the Celtics and I want to be very clear. The Celtics are the prohibitive title favorite for a reason. They are far and away the best team in the league this year, and everybody gets credit for that, um, from Joe Mazzulla all the way down to everybody in that starting five, even the depth player, players. Um, a guy like Sam Hauser isn't Sam Merrill, but he doesn't need to be Sam Merrill. He just needs to be good enough, and the Celtics have been awesome. So the, end, the real answer to the question is the Celtics don't have a weak link, unfortunately. But if I had to just to answer this question and not cop out, I would have to say Joe Mazzulla just because of the playoff inexperience. And there's a chance that he's outcoached in every round of the playoffs. You know, there's a chance that Spo, Tibbs, Rivers, um, I, for, I already forgot the guy, Malone, or even um, – who can I see make Dagonalt playing really well? I know you're really high on Dagonalt. Um, and what's the other guys? Lou, Tyron Lou. I can see all those guys. Like, I don't know who I would take um Joe Mazzula over in that sort of um as far as like a coaching head to head. So I think he would have to be the weakness because the players are excellent and we the proof is in the pudding on the court. If he gets out coached by Doc Rivers in the playoffs, he needs to he needs to go back to be he needs to go back to the second row of the uh, of, of the coach's bench. All right. Um next up and shout out to now the over 720 people joining us. Uh really appreciate you rock with us on a Friday night. Um I forget who is next to read, so I think it's XJ. XJ, go ahead. Yo, Fargo Tufo, what's going on? As a fan. Who are you rooting for in the play-in slash playoffs in the West? Assume standings end as they are today. Go round by round. What a fun question. We gotta we gotta go over to the standings here and, and I see just want to stay going right. on. down to Dallas. Um, I need Dallas to lose as early as possible. <laughs> so yeah, all right. I so. agree. I mean, I think we all agree with that. <laughs> all right. So if the season ended today, the seven eight matchup in the plan will be Phoenix would host Dallas. Um. Wow, got a root uh, for Phoenix. Fe- so, so I, he's I asking who we're rooting for. So, oh, who we're rooting for? Oh, Fe- Phoenix. Got a root for Phoenix there. Got a root yeah. for Phoenix. That's neat. And in the nine ten, oh good God, this is TNT. Give me the Lakers three. Warriors. Give me I'm gonna love this one. <laughs> Give me Steph. <laughs> I would take Steph too. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm sorry. I know everybody. I know it's cool to hate on the Warriors, but the Warriors have been one of my favorite teams ever. So, um, gotta go with Steph Curry. Same it's also here. cool to hit on the Lakers. Um, so I will <laughs> I will join you all and root for the root for the Warriors. Because actually, you know what? I'm rooting for the Lakers. Because these <laughs> Warrior fans need humbling. Because there is a ten, there is a there and is Lakers a, there fans is, don't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, two things can be true. But these Warrior fans, they still believe that they were like, oh, we're back. Like, they think they can win the title. I think most Laker fans are like, 
we're not very good. But these Warrior fans yeah. don't think that they're – Sean, Whatever. they're going to get humbled. So Steph Curry is going to re- retire soon, and they're going to get the worst humbling ever. They're going to get 20 years of humbling. So, like, they could have the next, like, two or three years. It's fine. <laughs> to me, at least. Steph they're, Curry we'll is going to – Steph's going to play long enough that Clay Thompson gets another contract, and he's going to retire. And they're going to be left with, with washed clay, which is going to be <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so then Dallas would play uh, the Lakers in the loser goes home match. Um Ah, uh, we got two versus two versus one here. Yeah, Dallas yeah. is playing in the Warriors. I don't I, see how you, your team Steph advanced. Steph is going to give them sixty. <laughs> Steph's yeah. going to drop sixty on Kyrie for the twenty sixteen playoffs. I this agree. Be, yeah. All right. So then, in the one eight would be would be Thunder Warriors. I'm rooting for Thunder. You guys know Thunder is my team in the West. I'm rooting for the Thunder all the way. I just love how they play. Five out. The, the SGA style is unique, n- n- like nothing we've really ever seen before in terms of his ability to get to his spots from the mid range and get to the rim at will. So, yeah, I got Thunder in that series. I'm cool with that. I'd root for, yeah, I'd root for Thunder also. Um, two seven will be Denver hosting the Suns. Suns. I'm rooting for the Nuggets. Give me Denver. Yeah. Give me Jokic, man. Jokic, baby. <laughs> All right, the, the and also, it'd be just fun six. to watch KD lose again, again. <laughs> it's just too and funny. A, but. And then ask out again. All <laughs> right, and then the three six would be Minnesota host, and hopefully, uh, Kate, Kat is back by then, hosting the Sacramento Kings. Like the and beam, I'm baby. rooting for the Kings. Like the beam, like the wow, beam, like the you beam. guys are both like on the, the Kings. Beam. Yeah, yes. I'm not an I'm not an ant guy. I'm a I'm 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 probably gonna go down as a career ant hater, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> Um, but also, they they have a guy on that team that I think would fit wonderfully with the New York Knicks, and I need them to lose as early as possible. So give me give me the Kings. I'll rock with you guys in that. I'm fine with that. I like how the Kings play. I, I like Sabonis. I think Sabonis is great. Fox is great. So uh, I like it. And if the Timberwolves go out in the first round with um, Michael Jordan Jr., Anthony Edwards, we are going to start a dialogue. <laughs> and then in the 4-5, uh, Clippers-Pelicans. Uh, oh. See, Give me the I kind of want to root. <sighs> Shout out to Rel Myers, big Pel- big Pelicans fan, host uh, Rel- uh host the Pels and Whistles podcast, has on website relmyers.com. Part of me, see, as a Nick fan, we we the, the Clippers are kind of like kindred spirits in terms of like the garbage that they went through, like you know, rooting for that team. So part of me would root for the Clippers, but if the if the Pels get through, it'll be nice. But I, I root for the Clippers, and and Ka- Kawhi's arguably my favorite favorite non Nick in the league right now. Really, I didn't even know that. Yeah, Any interest in potentially the Knicks pursuing Paul George if they get knocked out early? Is that something that is on people's minds, or is he just too old? We're we're off the Paul George thing. If we can get him at a decent number, but he's going to. Um, He's going to ask for a large number and knowing that somebody is going to give it to him. So, yeah, um, that's fair. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, just really quickly, I just want to. Um, I don't like. So, I don't really want to see the Pelicans be successful ever. And it's, it has nothing to do with. <laughs> It has nothing to do with the city of New Orleans. It has nothing to do with Zion, B.I., any of those guys. I actually really like the team that they've assembled down there. Love that they found Herb Jones with the 35th pick in the draft, um, what, in the 2021 draft. Um, really good stuff there. It's just the Pels are cheap, and I don't like when cheap owners are rewarded with Amen. success. Um, they Because, honestly, it would be fun to watch the Pelicans <clears> – <throat> win a playoff round and see what um, their ownership group does because they've literally never paid the luxury tax and kept these guys together. So um, they would have their, their face with really tough decisions this off season. And I just don't think they're going to do right by their fan base. So until they get a new owner, I'm not going to root for the new Orleans Pelicans. Fair enough. All right. So then our one, four matchup in the second round would be Oklahoma City hosting the Clippers. And I can't and, – and and I'll tell you right now, I'm going to root for the Clippers because the way – Wow. The way, the way that uh, Mensa feels about the New Orleans Pelicans organization is the way I feel about the Oklahoma City oh, Thunder organization. I about this. Originally – well, first of all, they should still be in Seattle. So let's start there. That's number one. <laughs> number two – that team needs rebounding, and they have 139 first-round picks. And they said, 
no, we're good. We can't like if this is the one time you were able to overpay for a player and did not bite you if the player doesn't work out. But you know what? But the genius Sam Presti, and don't get me wrong, it's a very good, very good team executive. Um, Hall of Fame team have, executive, sir. When you have the opportunity to take, when you have the oppor- when there is an opportunity for you to like make a deal that could pres- potentially position yourself, you should take it. Because remember, there's the same Oklahoma City Thunder team that was with, with three MVPs, and they were like, "Oh, they made the finals. They lost. They'll be back." I want to say, I want to say, I got to say this. It's okay to change your position, and we all can change our positions from time to time. But I very clearly recall you, Sean, when this conversation was going on about should OKC pursue Lowry marketing, and I remember GMAC was like, yes, they should go after him when when we had a, 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 I forgot who it was, from the Pelicans podcast on the uh, pregame show. And GMAC was saying, yes, I think they should pursue Lowry Marketing. I was saying, yes, they should pursue Lowry Marketing. Sean, you were notoriously like, nah, I think they should kind of wait. So it's fine that you switched up, but I just want to be put it out there that you did switch up. Do you acknowledge that, sir? Are you trying to put me on trial here, sir? <laughs> is this is this Nick at Night? Uh, what is it called? <laughs> Nick's at Night Court. Love Nick it. at Night, night Court. court. What I would say is no the Lori thing because Lori okay if if you're Sam Presti and you go to Danny Ainge and ask for Lori marketing and Danny Ainge is like hmm you got a lot of picks over there I'll take seven and then we can talk I well that I wouldn't do but they needed a big Daniel Gafford was right there they could have traded a first. They weren't going to get Daniel two. Gafford. Man. That could, doesn't fit. The, it doesn't fit what they're trying to do. They absolutely, they need rebounding. They need, it does fit what they they need size. Well, listen, when, listen, when they get when 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 Zubas crushes them on the boards of the second round, we'll come <laughs> back to this conversation. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So you guys got you guys got the Clippers advancing. It's two against yes. one. Clippers yes. advance. Yeah, I'm then, I'm a closet Harden fan, so um I want to see him I want to see him break the narrative the same way you wanted to see uh Jokic break that narrative XJ. I want to see um James Harden crush everybody's narrative and then it also helps us because it makes Darren Morey look like an idiot. So, I definitely wanted I'm rooting for <laughs> James Harden's success. I, I'm all about my agendas, you guys know that. Absolutely. All right. And then in the 2 th- the well, not the 2 th- I was going to say the 2-3, but since we had the Kings beating the uh Timberwolves, Nuggets are Nuggets, Kings. Thank you, Sacramento. It's been fu- it's been fun. Time to see ya. Okay, and <laughs> then moves on. Uh, <laughs> and then we have the rematch of the 2020 Western Conference second round series, aka the Paul George hit the side of the backboard series. The Clippers versus the Nuggets for the right to win the Western Conference. And listen, I have a future on the Denver winning championship, so you know where I'm. You know where I'm leading. <laughs> I mean, I'm on the same page. I, I don't know. This is going to be tougher for you, Mensa. I, I'm a, I'm, you, you all know I'm the, I'm the biggest Jokic guy or one of them, Mensa. You're, you, you were up there with me until this decision, so I'm not sure. I Look, I think Jokic is going to go down as a top 12 player all time. Um, I think he's well on his way there. He's going to get his third MVP this season. I think that's pretty much all been locked up. Um, but I like the Clippers, man. I really do. I like the Clippers a lot. I don't know who, honestly, like, I don't know who I would root for in this series. Um, I know both of you guys want to go with Denver, so I'm just going to not be a contrarian. And I'll say, I'll say Denver. I'd like to see uh, Jokic get back. Well, actually, let me say this. Um, My rooting interest is for parity. And the NBA has something really cool going on where we've had a different championship every year going back to 2019. Um, Yeah, going back to 2019, we have, we've had the Raptors, the Lakers, the Bucks the the Warriors and last year we saw Denver win so I'd like to see another team win um and I don't want that other team to be Boston please don't make me root for Boston in the 24 finals so um yeah I think here I will go for the Clippers not just be not because I don't like Denver but because I'd like for us to have a chance that we get another different winner and it doesn't have to be Boston so I'm gonna root for the Clippers here even though obviously it doesn't matter because both you guys are going with Denver the only thing is, for the Knicks to have the most epic title run ever, we're gonna have to beat the Nuggets, though. That's the thing. Like we're we're gonna you have to beat, beat the, the chip. <laughs> you gotta beat the chip. <laughs> we gotta we gotta beat the Heat, 
Got to beat the Celtics. Who else? Who else would he have to beat for it to be the most epic and title run ever? We don't have to beat anybody. It I'm has saying been for it to be 50, epic. It for it to dude, be we epic. can play what? Florida State in the finals. It's gonna be epic. It's New York. <laughs> what would I know? But fifty five years, legendary, legendary. Well, XJ's point. Give me, give me Miami in the first round. In mm-hmm. the second round, I want Cleveland so we can put those moist boys back in the be- in their bed. Um. <laughs> Give me, give me Boston in the conference finals, and then, yeah, I think, I think you got to go through Jokic. Beating gotta, Jokic, that's oh, it. The black Jokic versus the actual Jokic. <laughs> oh my goodness, let's do it, let's do it. That would be the best. Like honestly, like you wouldn't be able to talk. I would be blocked on Twitter by Elon Musk. <laughs> I would be that annoying, um, for the rest of like my life if the Knicks beat all those teams in one postseason. Like for, I, oh my goodness, Jalen Brunson, we would be, he would have a bronze statue outside his home. By b- before he got home from the parade, it would be it would be amazing. It'd be there. It'd just be there waiting for him. <laughs> for narrative purposes, I'd want Indiana in the first round. Oh, how all I the, forget all the all the team all the people in our fan base that was twerking for Halliburton, um, present company excluded. Um, don't, don't side eye me, Sean. Don't say, just just I, say I my say, name, I, man. I, I didn't know. <laughs> Brother, you, brother, you I don't, are not alone. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you're a Halliburton twerker, though. I ain't twerking like, for Halliburton. Halliburton. I don't. No, no, no. <laughs> like, like, no, like no, the no. Halliburton twerkers are like the people who like bleed orange and blue, and were like arguing that they would rather have Halliburton over brunch. Like, even if you privately believe that, bro, like, don't put that on Twitter. Like, come on. Like, it, it, it's like the people who like. It, hey, there was I never, a lot of weird stuff going on. I there. never said they should draft Halliburton over Obi Toppin. So like, I'm definitely ain't twerking for Halliburton. Yeah, so. You're not. You're, just, you're not. A, you're not. A, that's why I said present company excluded because like it's not you. Um, but yeah, let's put him in a spliff. Um, but don't worry, Hal. You always have the IST. And then I want Miami round two. <laughs> then I want Boston round three. Um, and then you know. I don't want to place Jokic because you want to put it. You want to about putting people in a spliff. Oh, Jokic! It's not, it's not the, like, oh, like we, nah, man. Oh, I feel that like would be. He would lose in the finals and just wouldn't care. He'd just go home. Like, all right, can I go back to my horses? Like, I'll see you guys next season. Um, who, like, what would be the most fun Western Conference team to beat? Honestly, the most fun Western Conference team to beat would be Dallas. That would be. So delicious. To say, don't want them to get there. But, but I don't yeah. want them there. But like <laughs> yeah. of all the Western Conference teams that I would want to beat, it would be the Dallas Mavericks in an NBA Finals. Not not the Suns beating KD and Book. I don't know. It'd be a lot of fun beating KD. Be being fun. KD uh, beating in KD the Garden. Be wow, <laughs> with the that, confetti coming down in Madison Square Garden, and, that would be and KD is there in a loss. I don't know, man. Yeah, that that's, would be Michelin that's, Star. That's, that's a good one. All right. Alex, uh, well, original Alex, aka Fargo Twofold. That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. All right, let's try and rapid fire these because I'm hungry. Um, let's see now what is next. All right, uh, Anthony Sixto, um, re XJ's OG clone over Randall theory. When when Randall gets back, we can see if he's the key to unlocking bags and Burks, aka Birkin bag. OG is untouchable, but we need even more gravity versus teams like the Nuggets. So Anthony Sixto has put us in the NBA Finals this year. Um, but yes, uh, your your thoughts, XJ and Dementor. Uh Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate it, Sixto, as always. And to your point, you know, I, I think that they both offer different advantages, OG and, and Julius Randle. And I could see that. I could see Randle potentially being the key to unlocking, especially Burks. I, I agree. Um, maybe Boyan a little bit less because I, I, but I, I can see him having this dynamic, um, where they're kind of next to each other on the perimeter. Randall gets the gravity, it, it, it tracks two, and then kicks it out to Burks on a wing or something to hit threes. Like I, I could, I could totally see that working. So I think it's viable, and I think potentially, I do agree that Randall is probably a better player to unlock guys like Alec Burks than OG and Anobi is. So I, I think this is fair. If you're giving me two OG Ananobis, one Mitchell Robinson, one Isaiah Hartenstein, one Deuce McBride, one Josh Hart, and one Dante DiVincenzo, um, we are the 86 Bears. I don't care about what the other team I don't care what the other team tries to do scoring. Like teams are struggling to score 100 points on us now. You're giving me a second OG Ananobi. Like I, I I'm sorry. I just think Offense is more important than defense in the NBA. There is no getting around that. That is just an absolute. 
Um, <clears throat> we know that because the most impactful players in the league, um, the most impactful defenders in terms of overall impact are not as impactful as the most impactful offensive basketball players. So while defense is essential, the more important of the two is offense. Um, with that being said, we would have oh my god two OG Ananobis. I I couldn't sign up. I couldn't sign up for that any faster. I'm sorry. Um, Julius Randall. Um, yeah. I can't even. I don't. Even, I don't even want to say like I love the guy because I don't really love the guy. But I appreciate <laughs> the guy. I will say that appreciation. Yes. I I absolutely appreciate him and he's essential to what the Knicks are doing. But if you're telling me that I could have a second OG Ananobi, I could have like you're. Uh, like what our defense is already so great and you're giving me another like you're allowing me to double down on my ananobi like uh, i'm sorry um it's it's just imagine mensa og og hartenstein it doesn't even matter who's in the front court at like, all. It doesn't, at who's all. gonna score and then i have og in both corners shooting threes like, yes oh, like, exactly yeah give me <laughs> give me the two ananobis thank you um i will sign for that every day of the week um like julius Randle's a great player um definitely did you can't you can feel how you want to feel about him but his resume as a nick is his resume as a nick it's been very impressive um you would have to offer me like to pass up on a second Ananobi, you'd have to offer me like a no doubt top 20 player. If, if you're if you're saying, hey, you can have a second Ananobi or a top 40 player, I wouldn't take that. If I can have a second top, if I can have another top 20 guy, then yeah, I'll take that over an Ananobi. But Ananobi's defense twice, oh my goodness. Good luck because Jalen Brunson was just good enough on offense to carry you when you have that level of defense. Well said, gentlemen, well said. Next up, Buzzer Beater again. And thank you to everyone for the super chats. We really appreciate it. And to the 780 people who are now tuned in, we appreciate you. Does Chewy Precious remind you of the X-Man? Um, I'm assuming he's referring to Xavier McDaniel. Um, what I will say is that um, Xavier McDaniel was like a 20-point per game score for the, for the Supersonics. He was, I think he was like runner-up rookie of the year. He was an all-star. So I don't know if Precious's ceiling is that, but I see where you're coming from. Like when you think of X Men, when you think of Xavier and Dane on the Knicks, maybe that's close. Maybe that's a closer comparison. But um, X A was like X A in Seattle was a problem. And like I said, he scored twenty, he scored like the average like twenty points a game. So, um, listen, if Precious if Precious comes anywhere close to that, then we have officially a fleece Masai Ujiri, and we have now gotten our revenge for the Carmelo Anthony trade. Yeah, I just want to jump because I don't appreciate this comparison necessarily because my dad would never name me Precious, but my dad named me Xavier after Xavier McDaniel. Like, this is a wow. true story. Um, that is who I am named after, and my dad wasn't going to name me Precious. So I, I, I'm i out on this just for sentimental reasons. I can't do it. Um. So shout out to Chris Herring. Um. I wasn't old enough to watch Xavier McDaniel play basketball. So the only time I think about Xavier McDaniel is in that one anecdote in the Blood in the Garden book. If you haven't read it, um, you should definitely go grab it. But <clears throat> this is to say I don't really know Xavier McDaniel fondly because he would walk around um, the locker room doing things that uh, was kind of weird <laughs> to me, to be honest. Um, I don't want to delve into it. Please go behind the book and read it. Um, you guys, have you read the book, um, Blood I, in the Garden? I've read it. So you know yeah, what I'm I've talking about yeah. where he's in the lock. Yeah, just like, that's just kind of strange, bro. Um, yeah. So I hope Precious Achua isn't doing what Xavier McDaniel was doing in the locker room. So, um, yeah, that's really my only comment on that. Um, Precious does not it remind me of the X-Man because kind of nobody can remind me of the X-Man for that. Like, one name. <laughs> Hey, real quick to your point, Sean, uh, he scored 23 points a game, 21 points a game, 20 points a game, 21 points a game, 17, and then 22 points a game early in his career. So uh, tough, tough comparison. All right. We have four Super Chats left. I'm going to go oh, out of order. It. Yes. I'm going to go out of order to read this one because the last three, because three of them are from one man. I'll let you guess who that man is. But let's go to Buzzer Beater again. Thank you, Buzzer Beater. Appreciate it. Is Tibbs recreated 2010-11 Bulls? Play styles are similar. Brunson, D, is D. Rose, Dante, Keith Bogans. We'll get back to that one. OG, <laughs> Dang, Randall, Boozer, Mitch and I Hart, Joachim, Noah. All right. Um, comparing Dante to Keith Bogans is a diss. 
let's just start there. I'm sorry, we just gotta do that off the like no, nah, like not do that. Uh Brunson D-Rolls, you're talking about like listen, point guards who put pressure on the rim, absolutely. Um is OG and an Obi Lou all day. I think he's better. I think he's better too. He's better. He's better for sure for me. But it's a it's a good comparison though. I think that that's that's the comparison. But um, yeah, OG's for sure better to me in my opinion. Randall and Boozer. I mean, I think Randall's a better passer. They're both similar rebounders. They get their buckets. I mean, that's not a bad. It's not a terrible. Not the worst comparison in the world. Um, and then Mitch and I heart joke him, I, especially. I heart in terms of like you can the, the way the way Tibbs utilized Joachim Noah after the uh, Rose injury, um, you could definitely make that comparison of I heart. Um, okay, okay, we're gonna wrap this up because this dude it keeps adding more super chats, and I'm hungry and I want to eat my dinner. <laughs> so let's go to His Holiness Robert W. Cross X Esquire. The casuals forever, and he spelled it D A. Interesting. <laughs> Burks and Bogey are cooked. Deuce needs more minutes. Um, agreed. I'm not giving up Burks and Bogey. Deuce does need more minutes. Yeah, agreed. Uh, um, Cosign, yeah. but I don't think I don't think Bogey's cooked. Uh, I will push back on that, but yeah, agreed with the rest of it. All right, next. Robert Cross X J. The only Nick analytic I like. Feel free to take the IQ victory lap. Damn fools. Okay, take your victory lap, and I'm gonna push back on Mr. Cross after, after you take. I, your victory I, lap. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take a victory lap on IQ. I mean, IQ. I, one thing I'll say is that I do think to really assess IQ, we have to wait. And this is what I said in our faculty chat as well. I think we have to wait like 50 games into next season. It's just too early. Things are not settled in. Um, you know, RJ's in and out, um, and obviously, prayers to his family and everything too. Uh, you know, Scotty Barnes is out. They're, they're, they don't have a roster. They don't really know what they're doing. They're trying to get Grady Dick involved. Like, it's just, I, they're, they're, they're kind of a mess and everything's too fluid. I'm not going to pause that, by the way, um, Mensa, because I saw you <laughs> smirk when I said, when I said that name. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so mature. I apologize. <laughs> uh, but no, <laughs> I just think I just think you need more time before we anybody takes victory laps either way about IQ. But obviously, I believe in IQ, and I think he's going to be a a stud and a monster at some point. And we're seeing him come on lately offensively. We're seeing him kind of come into his own and really blossom. His assist has gone crazy. His passing has been really beyond what I thought. What I think that any of us kind of thought it could be in New York. Um, and so, you know, the shooting's there. So he has all the pieces and all the makings of, you know, to be a star guard in the league and, and we'll see how it actually goes. But I think it's too early to take full victory laps is what I'll say. But appreciate it, Robert Cross. I'm, I appreciate the being the only Nick analytic that you like. Um, Robert, if we don't have IQ, we don't have OG. So keep that in mind. That's all I'm going to say. All right. Next, oh, Mensa, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, um, you really can't judge IQ when they're throwing dick in the lineup the way they are. So that's, <laughs> the <last> <laughs> <laughs> that's all I gotta say, guys. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much dick in that lineup, guys. I'm sorry. Oh, what, yo, Charlie. Too much. <laughs> I'm glad your son's not Someone's here anymore, clear. Mensa. By the way. Jesus, man. Someone's going to clip that, Mensa. Remember, like, <laughs> you know, 20, 23 years from now, Emery's going to see this and you'll be like, Dad, come on. All right. Um, next. Robert Cross again. And Robert, all jokes aside, thank you for the super chats and thank you everyone for the super chats. We really appreciate the uh, the, the generous contributions. We should have re-signed X-Men. Instead, I literally pound my fist through the floor with Charles Smith. Um as someone who is who is of that age, I will completely agree with you. We should have we should have kept Xavier McDaniel. Maybe we beat the Bulls. I don't know. Whatever. Because he was the uh Xavier McDaniel was like the uh like the Pat Bev of our team, but actually like good at better at basketball. I'm not gonna say good at basketball, that would have been a diss, but um yes, so there we go. All right. Two more. Because he just keeps throwing them, he just keeps, keeps lobbing them up. Robert W. Cross is study hall this weekend, Sean. I can make myself Robert, why are we having production meetings on this? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> the production meeting through the super chat feature is 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 tough, Robert. I love that. Like, listen, me, XJ, Mensa, and Andrew appreciate the fact that you have paid to have a production meeting. Uh, let me finish this chat. I can make myself available early Sunday a.m. because I have to go to the flipping airport before dawn. All right. Um, Mr. Mister Cross, uh, I am pretty sure that we have a rule that we don't. Okay. Maybe we can do Sunday. Maybe we can do Sunday. Let's maybe we could do Sunday. We'll 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 be in touch. And last but not least, uh, I got more lateral movement in the kitchen to the fridge than Bo- Bogey does in our hardwood. Bogey would cook you slowly <laughs> in the in the kitchen, the kitchen. <laughs> from the fridge to the kitchen. <laughs> We got to put more respect on Iso Bo's name. Um, the European Joe Johnson. We love Boyan Bogdanovich. Well, at least I respect Boyan Bogdanovich. Uh, he's just having a tough time, guys. Um, remember we remember all the things we said about Precious before he got it together? Um, I'm willing to give Boyan a little bit more leash. Uh, but also, it, it just may he just may not be a tips guy, and that just may be the end of it. But I think that... <clears throat> Hopefully he rebounds because we're going to need that $20 million in the offseason to see if we can get something better for him. So um, while Boyan deserves all the smoke that he's been getting, I'm still holding out hope for him to get better. All right. And that is that. So everyone, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you're watching this video, please like it. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe to Nick's Film School uh, YouTube channel. If you're listening on the podcast feed, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. If you can give us less than five stars, keep it to yourself, man. No no disrespect, but just keep it to yourself. Um, as you've heard from Robert Cross, apparently we're doing study hall on Sunday. Um, so I'll let you know what time that's going to be. Um, and stay tuned. Um, we have a – Are we doing? A, I don't know if we're doing a watch long tomorrow. I f- feel like we might be – I don't remember. But if we are, if our patrons pull up, um, and then obviously we'll, we'll definitely be doing a post-game show tomorrow. Um, I will be on the post-game then, show. Pull up to the post-game show. Let's go. Yes. Let's talk right, to Bogus yeah. and Fox. Let's do it. Pull up to the post-game show. XJ will be on post-game tomorrow. Uh, Andrew and I will be doing – so there's a watch-along on Monday for the Warriors game, and Andrew and I are doing the post-game on Monday night for the Warriors game. So that's another late night for us, but, hey, it is what it is. Um, and last but not least, I, I'll, I'll say this, and I'll let you guys close out with anything you want. I just want to say to echo it again, um, thoughts and prayers to the family of R.J. Barrett. Um, I can only imagine – I have a younger brother. I can only imagine use, losing my younger brother when he was age 20. Um, I got my RJ shirt on today. Um, it's un- it's absolutely unimaginable. Um, so, brother, take all the time you need. When they say once a Nick, always a Nick, this is, these are the moments that are included. Well, we will still pray for you. We still love you. We still care about you. Um, so peace and blessings to RJ Barrett and the entire Barrett family. Yeah, definitely uh, agree with that. And thoughts and prayers to RJ Bear and his family, whether he was a Nick or not, or is a random guy or is good at basketball or is a bust or is any of that, that really doesn't matter at all. It's horrible to, to see any human being going through that. So definitely thoughts and prayers to him and his family. Yeah, for sure. Um, like XJ said, doesn't matter if he scored 10,000 points with the Knicks does it, or if he never got in the game. Um, you never want to see tragedy like that. And again, just praying for him and hoping that um, in this moment he can have clarity, he can have some peace, and he can find some joy in the fleeting moments because I know how tough this is. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> with that being said, um, Andrew did correct us. There, It's the weekend, so there are no watch-alongs this weekend. So, um, But, yeah, you can definitely join XJ um, on the post game. Please do that. Um, it's the weekend. You guys don't have jobs. On well, some people do. Some people do have jobs. Um, the work on the weekends. Um, myself included. I work on Saturdays. But hey, let's enjoy. Um, and happy St. Patty's to everybody who um observes. That's this weekend. Um, and yeah, we'll we love to do this with you guys. We'll be recording later on in the week and just continue to tune into KFS for the the content that we push out every um every day basically at this point. Actually, last word. Uh, Bogdanovich. <laughs> <laughs> Grady Dick. All right. All right. Now we're out of here. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. We love you. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Knicks Nation, let's ride.